Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. So this episode started when I was just, you know, scrolling on my phone, as you do. And I came across a video about hobby tunnelers that was made by Connor Clary. If you don't know him, uh, Clary is a potter who is also a marvelous dry wit. And he comments on various cultural and historical things in his videos. You can find him on TikTok and Instagram, and I just find him hilarious. But in this hobby tunneling video that he made, which was prompted by a current case involving a woman who has been tunneling out a bunker under her house and has documented all of it on TikTok, he mentioned Harrison Dyer as a famous case of a hobby tunneler. And so I was like, hmm. And when I looked up Harrison Dyer, there was just so much other stuff that I was like, I am fully enthralled with this story and I want to spend a lot of time with it. Because there's science, there's contentious issues with other scientists, there's bigamy, there's a lot of drama without the tunneling, and then there's also tunneling. Like, just one of the headlines that I found right away when I was looking at um, newspaper archives was one that read, Harrison G. Dyer, said to be greatest living authority on bugs, is in court. And that was a divorce case. Um, There is so much more about him. There is a really good biography of Harrison Dyer that was written by Mark Epstein, who is also an entomologist, as Dyer was. That came out in 2016. And Epstein, at one point in an interview, said, quote, you could choose just one aspect and easily write a book the size of mine. And he is so right. But we're going to try to talk about it in broader strokes. And there's a ton of stuff that got shunted to the the behind-the-scenes notes. Uh, That book, incidentally, in case you want to look for it and get a, a much more robust version of this story is called Moths, Myths, and Mosquitoes, The Eccentric Life of Harrison G. Dyer. If you are a library user, you might want to look at the library. It is um, kind of expensive at this point. Like it ha- it didn't get, it doesn't appear to have gotten um, a paperback edition. And so it's only the hardcover. And sometimes those are hard to find secondhand yeah. and they're still pretty pricey. And then the actual new ones are like $70 or something. They're a lot. I think it's also from an academic press, and a lot of times those are a bit more expensive, too. Yes. Even the digital version is pricey. Yeah, yeah. So get thee to your local library. Yeah, and uh, if your local public library is like, I don't know what you're talking about, see if you're part of a network that also includes a couple university libraries, and sometimes you can get it that way. Yes, Get that interlibrary loan going. Yeah. So, Harrison Gray Dyer Jr. was born February 14th, 1866 in New York City. His mother was Eleanor Rosella Hannum Dyer, and his father, Harrison Dyer Sr., was a scientist. Dyer Sr. had done well for himself. He almost beat Samuel Morse to the patent for the telegraph. He made his money patenting various dye formulas. So young Harrison was born into a financially pretty comfortable life. Harrison Sr. died when Dyer was still a boy, though. He and his sister Pearl grew up among spiritualists. Eleonora and her sisters were all believers. A woman named Lucy Hudson also lived with them. Lucy was a homeopath. Uh, She was described as an aunt in this family structure, but she doesn't really seem to have been a blood relative. When Harrison Sr. died, the family was living in Rhinebeck, New York. And as a young boy, Harrison Jr. would hike in the woods near the Hudson River and catalog insects and other interesting things that he saw in nature. He was a collector from the beginning. (laughs) And his sister often went with him. And these preliminary notes would expand once he returned home. And he would often add sketches as well and sometimes watercolors. From those earliest days, he was especially interested in moths and their caterpillars. And then the family moved to Boston, where Dyer attended the Roxbury Latin School, which is a private school for boys that was founded in 1645 and still exists. He moved on from there to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he got a bachelor's degree in chemistry there. When Dyer was 22, his mother, Eleonora, died, and Harrison had inherited a very nice fortune. In the fall of 1889, Dyer got married to Zella Peabody, Zella was a music teacher from Los Angeles. We don't know how the two of them met, but it's believed they were both living in Boston at the time. 
Zella had moved to Los Angeles in 1887 and then started sending Harrison these Lepidoptera specimens from out on the West Coast. A lot of these she had raised herself from caterpillars. While Dyer was in the middle of an eight-month collecting trip in Colorado, he went to Los Angeles for their wedding. The Dyer's honeymoon was a specimen collecting trip. I love all of this. Unfortunately, it does not... It's so charming. Don't get attached. Yeah, it's not predicting a happy and compatible (laughs) marriage for them. Uh, This couple had two children. There was a son named Otis and a daughter named Dorothy. In 1890, Dyer published his first scientific paper, titled The Number of Molts of Lepidopterous Larvae. This paper, published in Psyche, a journal of entomology, opens by noting other papers that had been published and that, quote, it is evident from a perusal of them that considerable confusion exists as to the number of molts of certain species. Dyer's approach to counting molts involved measuring the widths of the heads of the larvae of butterflies and moths to determine where they were in their molt cycle. He noted that adding a record of width of the head should become standard in any research related to the molting of Lepidoptera. This work became really influential in the entomology world, and the measurement of larval heads to track their life cycles was adopted. The work he had done to correlate head size to life cycle using a constant ratio came to be known as Dyer's Law. This remains important in entomological work. It's not a perfect formula, just as with Sir Edmund Halley's population table we talked about recently in our actuarial science episode. The data kind of smoothed out a little bit, but this applies to roughly 80% of Lepidoptera species. Yeah, so you can basically look at larvae of something, see its head width related to its body length, and go, oh, this is probably at this point in its developmental cycle. And it's pretty accurate. In 1891, Harrison and Zella were once again on the move collecting specimens. On these trips, normally Zella assisted her husband. And then after their return from this long one in 1891, Dyer next went to Columbia University for an advanced degree in biology. He got his master's degree there and then continued to finish his Ph.D., which he did in 1895. His focus for his Ph.D. had been bacteriology, specifically the bacteria in the air in New York City. His next step was to work as an assistant bacteriologist at Columbia's medical school. And after two years in that job, he then went to the United States National Museum to study insects. This is interesting because it's not exactly a job offer, uh, and it's an example of how Harrison's familial wealth really enabled him to do as he wished, because he was not paid at the National Museum, although he was given a title of Honorary Custodian of Lepidoptera. Dyer could work without needing to be paid because he had that money from his inheritance. And with it, he made various investments, particularly in real estate. We've talked so many times about how a lot of the wealthiest families in the U.S. made a lot of their money by purchasing and then selling or leasing real estate in New York and other rapidly growing cities. Dyer did the same thing. He continued to acquire real estate throughout his life. He often bought multiple properties at the same time. One newspaper entry from the Washington, D.C. Evening Star in March of 1906, for example, lists real estate sales made through the firm of Early and Lampton in the preceding days. Dyer is listed twice, having acquired a property called the Ashburn for $50,000, and an empty lot on Harvard Street between 13th and 14th for $2,500. Some of his investments were rental properties, some were lots that he built on, and some he just held until it was a good time to sell them off at an appreciated value. So he had regular income to support himself and his family without needing the museum to pay him while he conducted research into Lepidoptera, This also meant he was really able to self-direct his work. Not getting paid meant that he didn't really have to answer to anyone. 
And the work he was doing in his honorary role was important to the museum. It was something that they needed somebody to do. He was really managing their collection of specimens, and that meant that he was organizing it, notating it. He was also acquiring new specimens and culling any that weren't really beneficial to the collection. So those culls were things like duplicates or poorly preserved samples that weren't going to be of scientific value. But Dyer also studied insects outside of the order of Lepidoptera. And one of these, the mosquito, became an important part of Dyer's legacy. This work caused a lot of problems with Dyer's frequent collaborator, John Bernhardt Smith, who was working on mosquito research before Dyer got involved. The two of them bickered over naming conventions and projects that overlapped and specimen collection, really anything that came up regarding mosquito research. All of this was going on as that research was becoming very important because the United States became involved in the construction on the Panama Canal, meaning mosquitoes were a very real problem. In the time that the French had been working on the canal, 22,000 workers had died, and a lot of those deaths were from yellow fever and malaria. Dyer collaborated with several other scientists on research about mosquitoes that ultimately expanded practical knowledge of their life cycles and behavioral habits. That enabled the United States to implement some control measures that uh, helped eliminate yellow fever deaths in the workforce. Dyer was so protective of his work in this area that when entomologist Evelyn Grosbeck Mitchell published a book titled Mosquito Life in 1908, Dyer wrote a scathing review of it in the publication Canadian Entomologist. And in that review, he accused her of plagiarizing the work of himself and other entomologists without credit. Mitchell had worked at the National Museum as an illustrator prior to writing her book, and Dyer stated that, quote, probably Miss Mitchell scarcely realizes herself how much information she has absorbed from the government bureaus. We should like her to try to imagine what her book would have been if she had written it before she came to Washington. Mitchell filed a suit against Dyer for libel, seeking $35,000 in damages. That lawsuit was dismissed because it wasn't really pursued after the filing. And reading it, it kind of sounds like she was just filing it to make a point. Uh, But this is just one example of a lot of fights that Dyer picked with fellow entomologists over the years. He and Smith argued forever to the point that Smith said he would no longer go to the National Museum if Dyer was involved. (laughs) Coming up, we will talk about Dyer's work as an editor and his complicated personal life, but first we will take a quick sponsor break. Somehow, despite all of the many things keeping him busy, including writing nasty reviews of anyone who dared to write on a subject he worked in, uh, Dyer found time to write a book on his family history titled A Preliminary Genealogy of the Dyer Family. That was published in 1903. He also became heavily involved in the publishing of entomological journals during his career. In 1904, he started editing the Journal of the New York Entomological Society, and he did that for three years. In 1909, he became the editor of the Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Washington. And then in 1913, he started his own publication, Insecutor Incitiae Menstruus. That name translates to Persecutor of Ignorance Monthly. Uh... (laughs) He started this one because he had a falling out with the Entomological Society, and he didn't want to edit their periodical anymore, and I don't think they wanted him to either. And that name is a dig at the organization and its members who he had bad relationships with. From the 1890s to the 19-teens, Harrison Dyer appeared, at least outwardly, to be a man who was living an accomplished, well-to-do, and overall conventional life. But that had actually started to unravel at home. And in 1915, things shifted considerably. And to tell that story, we've got to talk about a woman named Waleska Pollock. So Waleska Pollock was born in 1871 into a large family. Her mother, Louise, studied under German educator and reformer Friedrich Froebel, who is credited with inventing kindergarten. 
Waleska was deeply influenced by her mother's work in education, and she joined her in it once she had finished her own education as an educator. And Waleska also trained new teachers in addition to running a kindergarten, specifically new teachers from Black communities. In 1900, Harrison, Zella, and the kids went to the Blue Ridge Mountains for a summer trip. They stayed at a camp owned by George Pollock, and that summer, George's sister Waleska was also staying at the camp. So the Dyers met Waleska, they socialized with her, as well as with other campers at the various group activities that were available there. And Harrison and Waleska hit it off. He taught her about caterpillars and moths, and she started helping him with collecting. And then when they were back in D.C., and Waleska lived in Washington, D.C. also, he gave her a job at the museum as a typist, helping him compile his list of Lepidoptera. So she taught kindergarten during the day, and then in the afternoon when school was over, she headed to Harrison's office. They spent a lot of time together, and he even named a species after her, the Parasa Waleska. Trips like the one to the Blue Ridge were very common for the Dyer family, and after that trip, Waleska sometimes popped up at them. In the summer of 1901, they went to Colorado. Waleska arrived there late in the summer, although there's some uncertainty about whether she got there before Harrison left to go back to Washington, D.C. In 1906, the Dyers were in Southern California. This was also a trip for their daughter, Dorothy, who had mastoiditis and was prescribed a mastoidectomy. Her skull was drilled to relieve pressure. And then Waleska just happened to run into Zella's mother, Dorothy, while the two of them were both out on errands. Waleska hung out with the Dyers after that. Fancy this. I'm also in Pasadena. Like, it's really... (laughs) How weird. Our travels keep intersecting. How funny. Now, that same year, 1906, Waleska got married to a man named Wilfred P. Allen. That wedding took place in Richmond, Virginia. And Wilfred just sort of pops into the picture without any previous mention of him before that year. Waleska told friends and family that she had met this man on a train platform in Chicago and they had started talking. And when she started talking to him about the Baha'i faith, of which she was a member, he told her he was really interested in it, so she got his address so that she could send him some religious literature. And then, according to her story, their correspondence quickly turned romantic and he proposed. Waleska and Wilfred had three sons together over the next seven years. Wilfred was said to be living in Philadelphia for his job as a railroad man and then as a private secretary to a wealthy man named only Mr. McGrath. He never made it to any of his son's births, although Waleska's good friend Harrison Dyer was there for all of them. In fact, nobody ever saw Wilfred, although Waleska, despite having a rather modest living as a kindergarten teacher, was able to purchase various properties with what she said were funds that Wilfred sent to her. She also told friends that Dr. Dyer, who was very happy to see her starting a family, had helped the couple out financially from the beginning. So Zella Dyer was not ignorant of this odd and intense connection between her husband and Waleska. And she went beyond suspicion to downright angry when she discovered that Harrison had transferred the ownership of a lot of his Washington, D.C. real estate, with the exception of the family home, to Waleska's name. So Zella wrote Waleska letters asking her point blank about the relationship with Harrison, but Waleska always insisted the two of them were really more like siblings than anything romantic. But despite these assurances, things got really strained in the Dyer home, and eventually Zella went to Berkeley, California to be near her family, and she and the children had an extended stay there. In 1915, Harrison filed for divorce from Zella, claiming cruelty and desertion. Harrison probably wanted this whole thing to happen really quickly, but that was not how it played out, and things got really ugly really fast. Zella filed a countersuit saying that Dyer had misrepresented his income and that he held far more real estate than he had claimed and that his Smithsonian income was just a tiny sliver of what he was worth, which she estimated to be more than $600,000. So she wanted a much larger alimony than what Dyer had suggested in his filing. But early on, Harrison Dyer's case was dismissed by District Judge T.C. Hart, quote, on the ground of lack of jurisdiction, Dyer having failed to establish to the satisfaction of the court that he was a bona fide resident of Nevada. 
according to the Nevada State Journal coverage of the case. Yeah, uh, for clarity, because I didn't include it earlier, he had started to get paid after a while um, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture because of his work in insects. Um, And he claimed that he made $1,800 a year. (laughs) And that that was his whole income, nothing Which is what he got paid that. by the Smithsonian, yeah. but that was it. And that was nowhere near what he was actually worth. Waleska, meanwhile, had also filed for divorce from her husband, Wilfred. She had also filed in Nevada, and she had actually moved with her children to Reno prior to taking any legal action. Nevada only required six months of residency before filing for divorce. That was actually a law that had been in play. It got extended to a year, and then, like, right around the time all of this started boiling up, they had backed it up to only six months again. But even so, this proved difficult. She and Harrison almost certainly wanted to make sure all documents that would hold them back from being legally married themselves were taken care of. But it was still very difficult for a woman to get a divorce from her husband at this point, right? There had to be a case made that she had been mistreated in some way. And this was all made even more complicated because Wilfred Allen was a no-show. And pretty quickly, a judge sniffed out that there was something weird going on. Additionally, Zella Dyer, in that filing we've been talking about, had basically outed Wilfred Allen as a fictional character concocted by Harrison and Waleska so that he could be married to both women at once. So just to be super clear here, at this point, Waleska is trying to get a divorce from a fictional character. From her imaginary friend. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, On December 5th, 1915, Waleska wrote Zella a letter, and it's a doozy. She did not take any responsibility for inserting herself into the Dyer family and committing adultery. She instead chastises Zella for making it all public. She wrote, quote, Of course people are discussing it and enlarging on it and writing to all their friends, east, west, north, and south, so that even in Honolulu and Seattle and Europe, they have it all to talk about. Whose fault is it that all this sensational news came to the view of the public never to be forgotten? Doctor and I were quietly in retirement. It was your horrible, unnecessary, disgusting bill containing gross misstatements all to the injury of the two other parties. In this letter, Waleska goes on to assure Mrs. Dyer that the entire thing is going to disgrace her as much as her husband and Waleska herself, It's not clear why she thinks Zella might be disgraced in all this, except maybe through the shame of having her husband being a bigamist for so many years. Yeah, there's another theory that we could talk about in behind the scenes um, that is a whole other ball of wax. The final paragraph of this letter written by Waleska turns a little bit threatening. It reads, quote, a wise lawyer would have been so mild in his charges that we might have let the bill go by default, and so you would have gained your object. But now, only over our dead bodies. And what an audience we will have if this suit comes off. Not only our friends and our friends' friends from far and near, but all Washington from the executive offices to the saloons brought by your able advertising. I can see them now crowding the courtroom to suffocation, struggling in the corridors and standing in long lines down the streets, guarded by overtaxed policemen. Do you think we shall let this audience witness our defeat? Um, comedically, (laughs) after this, she signs off with, respectfully, Waleska P. Allen. (laughs) (laughs) This whole thing is wild. (laughs) So, Waleska appealed the initial court ruling. That ruling basically stated that it seemed like Wilfred was imaginary, that there was some squirrely stuff going on with Waleska's status as a resident of the state, Uh, that she seemed to be having a long-term adulterous affair, which would give her no grounds to file for divorce, Uh, this imaginary husband would have to be the one to do it. Right, because divorce law at this point, like, you had to show that you had been wronged by your spouse to get out of your marriage. And she could not do that, but he maybe could if he (laughs) he filed something. (laughs) Uh, In the court records of the Supreme Court of Nevada from December 1st, 1920, so it did take a while, That is a court that heard Waleska's appeal. It's noted, quote, While counsel appearing as amici curiae admit that plaintiff was a party to a marriage ceremony on September 5th, 1906, as alleged in the complaint, 
it is contended, one, that there is, in fact, no individual by the name of Wilfred P. Allen, but that Dr. Harrison G. Dyer or some other person at the of the performing of the marriage ceremony impersonated Wilfred P. Allen, and two, that if there is, in fact, a Wilfred P. Allen, the plaintiff is not entitled to a divorce because of adulterous conduct on her part long prior to the time when it is claimed that he failed to support her. These court notes go on to really lay out the ways that Waleska and Harrison had been sneaking around for years. It notes that they took trips together, that Dyer, who was normally fastidious in noting all of his life's doing in his diaries, just did not mention in those notes at all. It also mentions that as people started to get really suspicious of Waleska's marriage, she and Dyer started to create a paper trail to make the existence of this Wilfred Allen more believable. They opened a bank account in his name. He was reported on the census. The Allen family built a new house in D.C., but the money actually came from Harrison Dyer. All these facts were pretty obviously shady, but as they came up in court, Waleska did a lot of work trying to provide reasons for all these various inconsistencies. At one point during testimony, she said that Wilfred Allen was not her husband's real name, but that he operated under an alias because he had faked his death many years earlier and was basically hiding from his family, which she thought explained both the difficulty in finding anyone by that name and the fact that none of her relatives had ever met this man. He keeps on the DL because his parents thought he drowned. Like, that's literally the excuse she gave. Um, In the judge's decision on this appeal of her divorce case, he stated, quote, I cannot understand how anyone could listen to the evidence of the plaintiff and watch her conduct and demeanor upon the stand without being impressed by her utter lack of sincerity. We are going to pause here for a sponsor break. And then when we come back, we're going to get into Dyer's life after the divorce. And yes, finally, the tunnels. Dyer's professional reputation was, unsurprisingly, deeply damaged by the very public coverage of all of these three-way divorce proceedings and bigamy. And all of the scandal of his double life made his colleagues want to distance themselves from him, despite his proven entomological expertise. The Department of Agriculture actually fired him for unbecoming conduct. And in December 1917, Dyer donated 44,000 specimens to the Smithsonian. And then at the end of that year, he had what's described as a nervous breakdown, and he went to Connecticut for two months to recover. It took years for all of the legal tangle of Harrison and Waleska's divorces to be settled. The Dyer divorce was finalized at the end of 1920. Courts in Nevada refused to spend any more time on the Allen divorce. Finally, in 1921, Harrison and Waleska got married. They had been romantically involved for 20 years at that point with three kids, which Harrison then adopted because their birth names were listed as Allen, and he had to do so for them to take the last name of Dyer. I feel like there's so much imaginary paperwork in this mix, but uh, still, he was finally able to live openly with the woman that he loved. He also became a member of the Baha'i faith during this time, and he put his editorial experience to work in that community by becoming the editor of the periodical Reality. He used that magazine as a personal platform and published a lot of his own writing. As a consequence, he's kind of a, uh, my understanding is that he's a controversial figure in the Baha'i faith. (laughs) even today. Uh, He had always written fiction as well as scientific papers, and some of those were included in reality. But then in 1924, Dyer once again found himself in the news after another of his secrets came to light. During some construction work in the DuPont Circle area near the corner of 21st and P Streets, there was an accident On September 15th, a truck that was making a delivery behind the house at 1512 21st Street Northwest just fell partially into the street. The integrity of the street had not been compromised by a sinkhole or the construction work that was happening around it, but by a tunnel that had been dug underneath it. This was not just a rudimentary tunnel, though. It had multiple levels and electricity. So this caused a little bit of panic investigators and the public started to immediately think of reasons why there might be secret tunnels under the city. 
It could, some thought, be an old spy tunnel, or maybe it was used by bootleggers. This was all happening right in the middle of Prohibition. Or perhaps there was some other criminal or terrorist group using the tunnels to move through the nation's capital undetected. Journalist Larry Boardman decided to explore and document these tunnels. He described seeing a tunnel with a dirt floor when he entered, with German newspapers from 1917 and 1918 stuck to the ceiling. Boardman wrote, quote, cryptic marks and symbols marked the pages, suggesting a code. He also saw the electrical lights, although the power was off, and a pile of hundreds of broken glass bottles. He noted that the main tunnel was tall and wide enough for two adults to walk side by side in it, but that as additional tunnels split off from it, sometimes going down, those tributaries were narrower. He followed one to near the home of a former ambassador and another that almost reached the property of a publisher. Boardman, quote, followed a third hallway to find it ending at the basement of a house. The passageway had been cemented, then a second door, also cemented, and yet another which led to the basement. The house owner said he had never explored it. This write-up, though, ends with the revelation that these tunnels were revealed to be the work of Harrison Dyer, who Boardman described as, quote, a twinkling-eyed, stoop-shouldered scientist with carefully trimmed beard and gray-tinged hair. Boardman ends, though, by suggesting that somebody else may have been living in these tunnels, uh, no doubt to feed the reader's imagination. When Dyer gave a statement to the press about all of this, it was pretty relaxed. He said, quote, I did it for exercise. Digging tunnels after work is my hobby. There's nothing really mysterious about it. I have been interested in tunnels and underground construction work since I was a boy. I constructed tunnels or caves whenever I could. Dyer said that he worked on these tunnels from 1906 to 1915. That address of 1512 21st Street Northwest behind which the truck had been when it was uh, delivering supplies and fell into the street, had been his home, but he moved from there in 1915. He said that he was always careful to stay in his property lines. And if this description of the tunnels makes it sound like they extended past the lot of one home, that is because they did. Uh, Dyer had bought properties adjoining his own over the years to use as lab space for growing insect larvae and to house live-in staff. But he didn't stop digging when he moved in 1915. He just stopped digging at 21st Street. He had moved to 804 B Street and had made an even more astonishing tunnel system there, reaching 32 feet into the earth. These tunnels were really impressive, and you can occasionally find images, like diagrams of them online, and it's like a little mind-blowing. Dyer explained when questioned that the first tunnel project he started was to set a garden for his wife, Zella, and then the second one was dug as a way to move furnace ashes out of his basement. But in both cases, he just kept digging, telling a reporter, quote, when I was down perhaps six or seven feet, surrounded only by the damp brown walls of Mother Earth, I was seized with an undeniable fancy to keep on going. Uh, In this second setup, from the first tunnel of it that was allegedly for ashes, uh, and it was accessed near the basement, there were two more levels down. There were also vertical shafts on each end of the structure that helped with airflow. There were two smaller vertical shafts interior to the layout and a vented opening to a yard. The walls were bricked in many sections, and at least one of the vertical shafts had a ladder built into it. This tunnel system was carefully made enough that Dyer was comfortable letting his kids play in it. Please don't do this. No. (laughs) Maybe the most surprising thing about Dyer's tunnels wasn't that they were so meticulously crafted or that they had electricity or that they were the work of one man. The most surprising thing might be that they had been discovered and covered in the papers seven years earlier, In May of 1917, the Washington Times had run the story, Mystery Tunnel Joins Two Homes. It explained that when the tennis court over a section of the tunnel was excavated for new construction, they had discovered this tunnel. And in the same article, neighbors were like, yeah, those are the tunnels Harrison Dyer dug as a hobby. So this just wasn't a secret. It had gotten kind of lost in the news cycle. Yeah, it's very interesting that, like, The city just completely forgot in the course of seven years, or probably a lot of them never knew about it. This is, of course, happening in 1917, so World War I is happening. There's a lot going on, but 
uh, and also his divorce is playing out. That's probably where people are associating his name. But it's like, yeah, uh, we knew about the tunnels. So I don't, I don't know why this is a big deal in twenty four. Um, one of the rumors that has cropped up over the years, and you'll find it over and over, was that Dyer had dug these tunnels between his home with Zella and Waleska Allen's house. And that's, I mean, I understand why people get there. It's a pretty reasonable guess, given the other lengths that Harrison and Waleska were willing to go to to maintain their relationship for so long. But that is simply not the case. Uh, in the case of someone like Dyer, whose behaviors in all areas of his life are kind of difficult to understand, his motivations for tunneling may also just have to remain a little bit of a mystery, or we just take it at face value that that's how he stayed fit and unwound at the end of the day. I'm like, dude, find another hobby. This- <laughs> Uh, as a homeowner, I'm just like, ah, what if my neighbor was tunneling over underneath my house? Yeah, same. Even adjacent to my house, still not okay. Although he had rearranged his whole life to live it the way he wished with Waleska, his finances faltered after the divorce. For one, legal fees and the divorce settlement ate up a lot of his fortune. For another, he started making bad business decisions He just didn't have the level of independent income that had enabled him to just work for free in earlier years of his life. Yeah, he bought, like, some luxury properties at this stage that were like, ooh, do you really want to spend $2 million right now? Um, Let's just dig tunnels under them and also (laughs) make them structurally unsound. Yeah! He had been making his case to be rehired at the USDA at various points over the years. And in 1928, he pursued the issue again after he got word that some of the leadership were kind of considering that they might be willing to hire him back. He may have been a curmudgeon and have all kinds of foibles and personal drama, but he still was a really good and pretty respected entomologist. But he never got the job, not because they didn't hire him, but because he had a stroke before anything moved forward and he did not recover from it. He died on January 21st, 1929. Waleska had his ashes buried with her family. Zella died in 1938 after being struck by a trailer in Long Beach, Waleska died in 1940 from a heart ailment. Her obituary goes into depth about her work with the Baha'i faith, does not mention any of this other scandal. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, um, it's, uh, it's pretty nice. It literally, it's like Harrison Dyer's widow has died. They don't talk about any of the weird stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's very lovely. <laughs> I have so many notes for behind the scenes because Harrison Dyer. Yeah. Uh, But in the meantime, I have listener mail. All right. Uh, This is from our listener, Carla, who writes, Measurement in the UK, an educator's perspective. Carla opens with another comment on metric and imperial measures, as you seem to be enjoying them. I am another UK citizen who went to school in the 70s and 80s, part of the generation that was supposed to spearhead the country going completely metric. Like the listener from last week, but even more metrically included. I don't do Fahrenheit at all, or pounds and ounces. I naturally think first in metric for pretty much everything. The only exception is miles per hour because of speed limits on the roads. There was no imperial measurement used throughout my time at school, all well and good. But here is the twist. After my undergrad, I trained as a maths teacher and found that in the few years I was away... It had snuck back in, so I had to essentially learn Imperial in my 20s in order to teach it. In our national curriculum is the statement, quote, understand and use approximate equivalences between metric units and common Imperial units, such as inches, pounds, and pints. Can you imagine how annoying it is having to learn two separate systems and to convert units not only within but between them? This was my all-time least favorite topic to teach. I feel like, especially when you have students who are probably going, I hate this. It is not fun for the teacher either. They don't want to force you to do that. Uh, I am firmly in the camp of teaching slash learning maths for conceptual understanding, never just information to be memorized. Praise you for this, because I feel like that is the the better way. Um, Also, that we should be able to give a rational justification for everything we ask the kids to do. Quite the challenge in this case. Uh, And then uh, she makes a, a... a request for a possible topic. (laughs) And um, 
she, she mentions in her PS that she's a longtime listener going forwards and also backwards in time through the episodes. Nearly at the start, but not a complete list as I wuss out of anything too violent or grisly. Thank you for your excellent podcast and particularly keeping me company on Insomnia Nights. Carla, I uh, so appreciate this idea. One, I I can't imagine, and this is evidence of my weakness. I can't imagine having to learn a whole second set of units to a degree that you have to master it to then teach other people Mm. when you are in your 20s doing training after you have only known one. I know people do it. I don't think I could. I struggle with it all the time. Um, the, The best I ever got at it was when for a while I used to volunteer at the Georgia Aquarium and we would do weights of the food diets we would prep in kilograms. And that's the best I ever got at it because we were still getting shipments of food in pounds. <laughs> so, um, and even then, it's dicey. Listen, but I can I can calculate yards really quickly. Um, so I, I love getting all these perspectives, especially from the UK and thinking about how the teaching has had to shift and accommodate these weird back steps that are going on in some cases. Uh, if you would like to write to us and tell us about your relationship with metric or imperial units or anything else for that matter, you can do so at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you would like to, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite show. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.